It is my great privilege to uh, welcome uh, the, the Coach K of CEOs. <laughs> I, you're, you're kicking me out, it's my last year? Uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. So, uh, but uh, it, uh, among other reasons, he has a, a fairly unpronounceable name. I'm gonna give it a try here, but uh, uh, Yukazoglu, have I come even close to being That's right? It's perfect, there? no one else even tries. Joe Yu is the <laughs> operative word, but nicely done. So yeah, so I, I figured there was like some, uh, something like Coach K equivalent for you, but, uh, but it is really a wonderful thing to have Joe join us. Uh, to have him join us in person is, is such a terrific uh, uh, privilege for us. And uh, obviously, Deloitte is an incredibly important partner of the school. Uh, probably everyone in the room is, uh, has either decided to go to Deloitte uh, or is considering it. Uh, no pressure on that, Joe. Uh, but uh, it, it's, really, uh, it's really a wonderful partnership, and to have you here uh, further cements that partnership. Now, you became CEO in, I think, June of 2019, and, uh, and you probably thought for the, the first half year or so, wow, this is a sweet job. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so, so tell me, you know, how, how did you come to grips with not that long into your tenure as CEO that all of a sudden this COVID thing was going to completely change everyone's life? Well, first, it, it's a real privilege and honor to be here. So appreciate the introduction and the, the feeling is mutual relative to the very strong uh, Fuqua Deloitte partnership and you know, several hundred uh, incredibly successful alums at our firm and by the sort of measure of my interactions today, the, the future and all of you and the talent pipeline coming in uh, looks, looks incredibly bright. I, I love the question relative to having a curveball thrown at you. And you know, I remember interviewing with our board in the process of, of taking on the role and of, of all the different strategic issues and questions that were posed. Uh, none of them had anything to do with a global pandemic. Although I will tell you a funny story. I was talking to one of our former CEOs recently, and he said to me, you know, back in, in 2005, we put together a pandemic playbook. And I said, well, well where's that? Wish I would have <laughs> known you had something like that. Oh, it's in such and such as garage in retirement in Vegas. <laughs> but in, in, in all seriousness, whether it's a global pandemic or some other phenomenon, it, it is indicative of the fact that w when you take on privileged leadership positions, you should just expect the unexpected and that much of your role is in the ability to lead through change, the ability to lead through uncertainty, having a learning mindset to go get really smart about whatever the particular topic of the day is that might have nothing to do with your professional background or that which you've become expert in, but that ultimately you're responsible for you know, the entirety of the organization and the biggest event in society, the biggest event in the world around you becomes your biggest event. And so it was a, a, a pretty quick pivot and it, it was a moment at which you tend to find when there's a shock in the system, either it brings people closer together or it serves as a wedge to drive people apart. And, and we're pretty proud of the fact that within the Deloitte family, it's brought us together. We've weathered it incredibly well. And you know, for all the, the difficulty and, and the tragedy in society at large, we now find ourselves in a position where it's actually accelerated a bunch of trends in the broader market that are incredibly conducive to driving demand and uh, uh, increasing the needs of clients across a whole host of dimensions. And so we're, we're, we're actually pretty optimistic about the future, recognizing we're still in a pretty challenging societal period. So when I, when I gave you the, the Coach K introduction, I dropped out the part of, of all of your success and the, and the fact that you're leading uh, what is the, the largest professional services organization, more than 120,000 professionals. And of course, it's, it's an interesting environment because those professionals can be uh, independent to some degree. Uh, and, uh, and yet, you know, the, the Coach K part here is when you look at all of these best of lists, 
you as a CEO are on those lists and Deloitte as an organization is always on those lists. And so what, what have you been able to do to really build trust with your, with your teams in the face of COVID where, where trust was dissipated so, so rapidly because of isolation? I'd actually suggest that you know, trust may be the most important word societally right now in an environment where there's uh, such polarization and many of the institutions that have historically been or the, the source of information and guidance to the population at large have seen significant declines in trust over the past several years. And there's a lot of phenomena behind that. COVID's only one piece of the story. But one of the most important grounding principles, particularly when you're in a stressful, uncertain environment, is to have the transparent, honest conversation. And when you're in a leadership position, you're in that position because you're entrusted by others, in this case, your colleagues in the firm, to process a lot of complexity and a lot of information in the overall external environment and distill it into something that's understandable, something that is ultimately viewed as candid and transparent. Where I saw some leaders go wrong is you know, to, to get out ahead of the facts and make promises and for very well-intentioned purposes. But if you went out at the beginning of this and suggested that you know, either it's, it's not a big deal or it's nothing different from a flu, well, in the early days, we didn't know. And it may well have been that things had played out positively, but it's also possible that they wouldn't. And once you've sort of over-promised or once you've oversimplified, it's really hard to ever get back that trust. And so we had the honest conversation about what we know, what we don't know, what the potential risks are, the spectrum of eventualities in terms of the impact on society at large, health, the economy, the organization. We made the solemn commitment to our people from the very beginning that everyone's health and safety would be the number one overriding consideration, irrespective of any business or economic implication. And then we backed it up with our actions throughout. And then you sort of got into the, or the brunt of this, and what you saw was different populations being impacted differently and a need to tailor your support to the particular circumstances that were most relevant. So as one example, we identified early on the potential for a disproportionate impact on women. And we've seen that play out more broadly in society. And we made a commitment on day one that we were not going to let these circumstances take us backwards in terms of all of the tremendous progress and leadership that we'd made relative to gender. And we put the right support in place, the right resources, the right programs. And what we've actually found is that over the past couple of years, the turnover rate within the firm for women is actually even lower than it is among men. And that's the exact opposite of what you've seen more broadly in terms of, of, of the brunt of the pandemic from an employment standpoint uh, being, being disproportionate. Same relative to uh, mental health, the incredible challenges that people have in this type of societal circumstance, impact on family members, uh, implications of, of isolation and social norms being disrupted. And so we said, we're gonna put programs in place to not just to be there for our people and support them when they need resources, but to normalize the topic so that if somebody you know, historically has had a physical ailment, they'd come forward and talk about it and get to the right resources, that we needed to make certain the same environment existed relative to mental health and to train up our, our leaders and our managers to recognize potential issues and get people the right help. And so these are just two among many examples, but that illustrate the primacy of people and in an organization like ours, notwithstanding the proliferation of advanced technology and all the incredible innovation that's taking place, we're still first and foremost about great people who we take great care of as part of the Deloitte family. And we're, you know, we're pleased to see that come through when different organizations survey our people that ultimately factor into these rankings. 
So uh, you're, you're in a, an incredibly uh, unique and interesting position in the sense of you're, you're overseeing a very large firm, one of the most important uh, uh, professional services firms in the world. At the same time, you're working with a bunch of clients. So I'm going to give you the ability when you answer these questions, if, if it's something that, that you want to say Deloitte does well, then you can use that example. If you want to use examples of you know, bad practices, you can, you can point to others. Um, <laughs> so I can think of a few. <laughs> so, so as you, you raise this issue of uh, the, the, the COVID crisis actually led to uh, serious issues around marginalization of certain populations. And uh, you have been very outspoken around the importance of of equity as both a, a social and economic imperative. And you've been involved both within Deloitte and broadly with uh, a variety of different organizations in trying to make progress on this issue. So can you just start to unpack why you start from it's both a social and an economic imperative and then, and then we'll go from there? I'd agree with that framing. And there's actually a, a fascinating debate taking place right now as to you know, which of those should be the face of the issue. And there's been some back and forth. At times, people have said, well, you should really describe it as fundamentally being an economic issue and ground it in the business case. And others have said, well, no, you should really ground it in being a social issue and the right thing to do, and that you almost cheapen the commitment by you know, turning it into numbers and business cases and, and grounding it in economics. And, and as with most uh, issues in society that have become polarized, I think ne neither extreme is uh, necessarily the right answer. It, it really is a combination of the two. Clearly, the events of the past couple of years relative to the disparate impacts of the pandemic, relative to the racial justice and social justice issues that have been um, you know, very, very visible, have demonstrated that society has a lot of work to do. And you know, it's easy to issue statements and slogans, and you know, that's actually sort of the least impactful part of what organizations can do. But if you want to, to be a leader like Deloitte, you have to match that with action, and you actually have to demonstrate progress. And normally, if there are issues in the business world that are considered to be important, well, you put some intentionality around it, and you measure it, and you set objectives, and you disclose it with transparency. Like All of those things are normal parts of any big strategic important topic, and so why would this issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion be any different? And that's exactly what we did. We put out last year our inaugural DEI transparency report, and, and we actually made the conscious choice to go a lot further than some of our peers in terms of the level of disaggregation of data, in terms of being very clear and vocal about you know, some of the areas, not just where we have been the leader, there's a lot that we're incredibly proud of, going back to the, you know, the early 90s when we were the first in our space to put in place a, a programmatic effort around the advancement of women. We're the first in our space to be led by a woman, first in our space to be led by an underrepresented minority. So there's a lot of things we've done well, but there's also a lot of things where we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of representation, and not just sort of at the aggregate level, but when you look at individual groups and when you look at progression within the firm, so disaggregation by level, when you look at statistics around turnover. And so we, we put all of that out there with an expectation that it would be met with a response of appreciation as opposed to a response of critique. And that's exactly what we got. People don't expect perfection. They expect honesty. They expect transparency. They expect straight talk. And they expect a plan around what are you going to do about it. And so we set some very specific goals. We shared some of the root cause work in terms of where you know, there were underlying phenomena that we believe to be most responsible for disproportionate representation. And we've aligned around actually achieving this as an organization and cascading it all the way throughout. So there's accountability within the cohorts that can actually drive this behavior on the ground day to day in the sourcing, in the development, in the assignment process in the evaluation and compensation process. And you know, a little over a year in, 
the progress has been remarkable, but there's always a balance between celebrating great progress without in any way or declaring victory because we still have an enormous amount of work to do to get to where ultimately we believe we need to be. So uh, something that I, that I know uh, you, you think about a lot is that the role of, of, of business and the role of business leadership has changed quite profoundly in terms of these expectations that you will tackle social issues. And, um, and so as you think about the number of things that, that come across in society as big challenges, how do you decide when you're going to weigh in, when you're going to take a public stand? And, uh, and, and I know that you don't expect when you do take a public stand that, that everyone will agree with the stand that you take. So can you help us understand uh, you know, for example, I know that after the events of uh, January 6th, a year ago, that you, you came out publicly very strongly. Help us understand how you make those decisions. There is a, a broader context here, going back to the observation you had earlier around you know, trust in some institutions in society having declined, and what that's done is it's created a void, and business is actually one of the few highly trusted institutions that's left. And some of the polling is fascinating relative to the trust that people at an organization have in the leader of their organization. And because the trust in other institutions is lesser, there is more of a demand for business to take a leading role, and there's a lot of good in that. And more and more we see that individuals who have tremendous choices in terms of where you choose to contribute your talents and where you choose to make an impact are judging what organization they want to join and remain or not remain at based on alignment with values based on the organization being willing to stand up visibly for those values. Now, that is not the same thing as politicizing the organization. And what you don't want is for organizations to, to, to be viewed as overly political, because what that will do is it will destroy the very trust that we've just built up that places business in a more trusted position than most other institutions. Is that an easy balancing act? No. But with transparency and with consistency, you can accomplish it. So we have a very robust framework that we work through consistently for any issue that comes up that guides not only whether it's the type of issue where we should have a position, but also what words we use how we speak out in favor of our values in a way that's intended to bring people together, in a way that is intended to leverage an organization like Deloitte to try to be part of the solution in a society that's overly polarized, that's overly charged to find common ground in issues that we can rally around. You mentioned the events of, of last January 6th. Well, one of the sort of most foundational elements of our country, our democracy, is the peaceful transfer of power. The respect for uh, free and fair elections. Not suggesting what the result of the election should be. We want our people to be out voting, out using their voice in a way that they're passionate about. And they're gonna make whatever choice they want to make relative to what candidates they support, what positions they support. But the act of enabling every American to have access to the voting process. And then the respect for the result of that democratic election and the transference of power in a peaceful and orderly fashion, that is a hallmark of our democracy that ought not be political, that ought to be a unifier across people who have different party affiliations, different political beliefs. And one ought to be able to engage in some straight talk. One ought to be able to call an armed insurrection an armed insurrection. I don't view that as in any way being political. I do absolutely view that as using the voice of an organization like Deloitte 
to stand up for our values and to be uh, a source of credibility and a source of confidence in society in a time when our people were rattled. And one of the things I went out of my way to make clear to our people is that we do have confidence in these democratic institutions, notwithstanding the, the fear and the concern of people turning on the TV and seeing these images, that, that democracy will win, that our institutions are strong. And that's really important when you're in a leadership role to be able to help your people through difficult and unsettling times. So polarization is, is very real in society, and, uh, and we are at an interesting moment in time when, when business is the most trusted institution. Uh, we have an initiative here at Duke called the Dialogue Project, which is geared towards uh, asking the question, what can business do to reduce polarization and create more civil discourse? Are you optimistic that, that business is up to this challenge and, and can actually provide that role of reducing polarization? And how do we avoid getting caught up in that polarization? Well, the, the very title of the project is telling discourse. This, this is about a respect for dialogue, a respect for the civil exchange of ideas and you know, one of the unfortunate aspects of the polarization that we've seen is in some cases an attempt to, to shut down dialogue, to ban discussion of this topic or this particular text, or you, you, you pick your, your dimension. And one of the things that's actually given me energy about today, about being on campus at an incredible institution like Duke is that this is, this is the arena in society that ought to most stand for those values of you know, open inquiry, of civil dialogue, of doing some listening. There's, there's way too much certainty out there where people on all sides of issues think they've got it all figured out and they have the one right answer that has to be mandated and institutionalized and no ability to hear out other differing and divergent perspectives. And you know, my belief system is the exact opposite of that. Um, if I've learned anything from the past few years in this role, it is that the ability to maintain an open mind, to constantly seek out new information, to challenge your hypothesis, actually to celebrate if you change your mind because you initially predicated your view on one set of information and you learned more, you educated yourself, some new facts came to light that weren't previously available to remain agile. That is the hallmark of leadership in a society that's changing as quickly as ours is. In all that change comes huge opportunity. The level of opportunity that all of you are going to have you know, joining uh, great institutions at the time that you're joining is tremendous, but it, it comes with it a need to be highly agile, to thrive in disruption, to manage through change. And you don't do that very well by digging in and having one position you're sure is right and not wanting to listen to others. You do that by being inclusive. You do that by assembling diverse teams and being willing to listen to views other than your own, even if you might find them objectionable, because the worst that happens is you reconfirm your own point of view. And maybe once in a while, you even learn something or evolve your view or have come to appreciate why different people might have views that differ from your own. And this is absolutely a business issue as well as a societal issue, because you want to promote that kind of a culture within your organization to get the best out of people, to build diverse, inclusive teams that in our case are ultimately going to deliver the very best, highest quality advice to clients. So uh, you, you want to get the best out of your teams and uh, you also want to attract and retain the, the best talent. And so going back to the, the survey that Deloitte runs that, that you referred to in your opening remarks, uh, a, a very uh, uh, high uh, area of concern is the battle for talent. And in talking about this, I've heard you say that what companies really have to do if they're going to win this battle for talent is they have to offer a premium talent experience. Can you explain what it, what it means to, to be able to offer a, a premium talent experience? There's a lot being written these days about 
the war for talent, the job market, the willingness of, of, of people to change jobs and change careers at extraordinary rates that are, that are higher than the historical pre-COVID norm. And often what you see is a negative lens on that, a concern about worker shortages or companies concerned about the, sort of the instability and the talent dynamic. There's a hugely positive dimension to all of this, though, too. What you're seeing is market forces at work, where organizations are going to have to compete for great talent. And the ones that do it well, as is always the case in a free market system, will thrive. So every month, we have two to three times as many people joining Deloitte as the number of people who choose to depart for an opportunity elsewhere. How do you create an environment where you're the net winner, where people want to join, stay, build a career, thrive? Well, there's a bunch of dimensions to this. There is absolutely a dimension of connecting people to the purpose of their work, demonstrating that ultimately the great work you do is not only resulting in your own career progression and advancement, which is important, but also how it connects to doing something highly impactful and meaningful for your communities and for society at large and to create economic growth that ultimately is inclusive and accretive to society as a whole. That's really important. There is a talent experience dimension in terms of creating the right flexibility so that you can integrate you know, your work life and your personal life. And this is another topic we could certainly explore in terms of the you know, ongoing evolution of how much is done in person versus how much flexibility is afforded remotely. But that is absolutely one of the questions that we get from people and where we are trying to differentiate the Deloitte experience relative to being able to get the best of both. The really impactful in-person experiences that people desire to advance their careers along with the tremendous benefits that come from enabling a level of flexibility and remote work and cutting down on commuting time, that's a huge piece of this. There is a, a, a dimension of you know, competitiveness in terms of you know, the overall portfolio of benefits. I mean, all of these things fuse together in ultimately helping individuals decide, is this the organization that aligns with my values where I think I'm going to have a really rewarding, impactful career, where I think I'm going to be valued for my contributions, and where I'm going to be treated as a valued and respected colleague? So in addition to the, this battle for talent, the, the next item on the list that is worrying companies are supply chain issues. And as you look at the convergence of this battle for talent and the supply chain issues, um, it has led to some fairly significant inflation, inflation that we haven't seen for many, many years. Your, your reaction to this, and I quote, was uh, the fact that we have this inflation, probably not all that great of a shock that the basic laws of economics still hold. Um, so uh, would you <laughs> like to elaborate on that? <laughs> this is another area where you know, too often um, you know, people try to take facts and you know, manage them to fit you know, their desired narrative. The reality is a you know, somewhat nuanced and complex one. So there is a supply chain disruption dynamic that's part of the story here. And if you, you know, go back pre-COVID to the last several decades, many organizations structured their supply chains with a huge emphasis on efficiency, driving out every ounce of cost, real-time production methods where you had just enough arrive at just the optimal point in time, and, and the benefit of that was, was obviously a, a lowering of the cost structure. What COVID did is it brought to the fore the risks of running that tight and of placing an over-reliance on efficiency. And now you're seeing some level of rebalancing toward resilience, toward you know, building in some level of 
um, redundancy and diversification, and, and that takes time. That's not gonna sort itself out overnight, and coupled with an environment in which consumer spending has shifted uh, with less in-person activity to more consumption of physical goods, at the same time you've had supply chain disruption, that goes back to the age-old supply and demand issues. That's one piece of this. You've also had an extraordinary level of government support being pumped into the economy to you know, ensure that citizens at large can, can weather the, the difficult COVID environment. And again, when you uh, put a lot of additional currency into the economy to the extent that that outpaces the productive capacity of the economy to sort of deliver goods in exchange for that currency, it's gonna, it's gonna have a, a devaluing effect on the currency. Now, you know, some don't like that piece of the narrative because in the broader political debate around government spending and whether certain programs uh, can, can, can be funded in a fiscally sustainable fashion that might sort of create a headwind to the arguments. But the reality on the ground, if you strip out sort of all of the, you know, the, the, the politics and the messaging, is that there's elements of both that are underlying drivers of the current inflation that we're seeing. So uh, this, again, referring to the, the CEO survey that came out in January that Deloitte runs, uh, very interesting results which show that there is a lot of confidence on the part of CEOs that, uh, that they're going to have very strong performance in, in the coming year. And, um, and you, you have an interesting theory about this because the reality is that, that we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with this battle for talent, we're dealing with inflation, we're dealing with these issues of polarization that make life so complicated. What is the source of this optimism on the part of CEOs? It really is a fascinating finding. We, we do this survey of CEOs in partnership with Fortune, and we last ran it in the fall time when conditions on the ground around the pandemic were, were, were significantly better than they were in mid-January when we took this reading. And, and yet the CEO optimism sentiment didn't deteriorate at all. And when you get behind it, you sort of marry that aggregate data up with what we're hearing in the C-suites of our clients, there's a couple of dimensions to this. One, there is a level of confidence that comes with being put through the ringer and successfully getting through it. So the past couple of years, how many things have been thrown at us between the onset of the pandemic, the Delta surge, the Omicron surge, outside the COVID realm, the political instability, you reference January 6, the sort of social issues that have come to the fore. There's just, there's been constant external shocks. And yet the business community has pretty successfully navigated all of them. And so with that comes one, a realization that that's just the new normal, that there will continue to be a pace of change and a level of you know, external disruptive events that aren't going away. So sort of become more comfortable and accept that. But just as importantly, a confidence that having so successfully navigated all these things to date, that businesses will continue to be successful even though there's a level of unpredictability as to exactly what issues it is that'll hit from week to week. Then you layer onto that the fundamentals in the real economy, the level of investment that is being made in digital transformation, and the payoff in terms of you know, more efficient operations, in terms of better leveraging data, in terms of you know, engaging digitally with customers in new ways. There's so much in the innovation arena that's leading to optimism around sort of real economic growth and real productivity improvements that the, or the combination of, of, of those phenomena absolutely have CEOs optimistic. Now there is, a, there is a emotional intelligence element to the conversation though. In a, let's just take you know, the second or third week of January when society was in pretty tough shape, lots of travel disruptions, people dealing with concerns around whether their kid's school would or wouldn't be open because you saw a bunch of disruption in the, in the school environment, COVID cases shooting up, 
uh, increased hospitalizations. The CEO optimism didn't necessarily measure the life circumstances of, of the average American at a point in time when people's daily lives were pretty challenging. And, and that's also an important lesson, that you, you want to make sure that you don't conflate macroeconomic business success and positive outlook with you know, real human beings and their sentiments day to day. And in this case, it goes back to the conversation around how you create a premium talent experience to make certain that you're actually supporting your people through a really difficult time at the same time that you're seeing underlying signals that the broader outlook is quite positive. So you, you mentioned uh, this technology transformation and this unleashing of productivity to, to follow. Uh, what you said to me before we came to the front of the room was jobs aren't going away. You know, so people who think that, that technology is replacing jobs are just wrong, that it's creating jobs. So that may be um, something this audience would like to hear. How interesting is this dynamic? You know, for the last several years, um, we've had some prognostications that the level of technological advancement is so rapid and that the sophistication of the technology is essentially working its way up the curve in terms of being able to replicate some historically, fundamentally human attributes that there were fears that there would be widespread unemployment, that the impact of adopting this technology would be destruction of large numbers of jobs, and how would society respond to that? What have we actually seen with this proliferation of technology in full force? We've seen the opposite. We, we, we've seen that actually, on a net basis, and I use the word net intentionally, and we need to come back to that because it doesn't imply sort of one standard answer across the board, but on a net basis, this level of innovation and disruption is creating far more jobs and far more needs for people than the number of jobs that are being displaced. Now, society has a challenge in bringing everyone along this journey because the fact that on a net basis, employment opportunities are going up isn't all that relevant to you if you're an individual who's had your job automated and don't believe that sort of you have whatever the skill sets are to take on the new type of opportunity that's being created by the technology. And that goes to the conversation around inclusive growth, around upskilling, around making certain that we have an equitable society where everyone participates in this, this tech-driven boom. But this phenomenon is not new. You can go back to the sort of transition from an agricultural age where 90% of the people in the country were employed on farms, and machinery essentially has driven that number down you know, well below 10%. And that seemed to work out too. We saw the transition of the economy over uh, many decades throughout the Industrial Revolution, and once again, an environment where many more jobs were created than the number that were displaced. And you know, for those in this room with a, a, a Fuqua education, like, that is a, a gold mine. The opportunity that comes from this, of leading the economy through this transition, is uh, unbelievably positive relative to the career outlook, relative to the growth opportunities. But we all also have an obligation, and this goes back to or your question around the role of business, to make certain we're doing this in a way that brings along all communities and that the opportunity is an inclusive one. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, two more questions, and then I'm going to turn over to the audience so if people can uh, get ready to, to ask those questions. So the first one is, uh, coming back full circle, where uh, not long after you became CEO, you, you went into crisis management. And it's been crisis management for the, the last two plus years now. What, what did you learn about yourself as a leader in navigating that crisis? And how did you keep yourself from burning out in that constant uh, crisis mode? I won't sugarcoat. Um, the initial months were 
not the most pleasant. And you do feel uh, weight of the world on your shoulders, that you have an incredible institution like Deloitte that you're ultimately responsible for, and this is the you know, livelihood and employment of an enormous number of people, and you know the decisions that you're making are going to be incredibly consequential. Um, that said, you should all take great confidence in the old adage that you even surprise yourself in terms of what you can accomplish when you're in a position where you have no other choice. <laughs> it's not like you could choose to either have a pandemic or not have a pandemic. And one of the big learnings here is the value, going back to the earlier conversation around creating an inclusive environment, I had a team that had formed a dynamic, and this is one of the values at Fuqua, which is why I, I genuinely believe that the alums are so successful at Deloitte, that values inclusive team dynamics, where everyone's voice is valued and you take into account a lot of different perspectives. That doesn't mean everyone's always going to reach consensus and it's going to be 100% alignment. Your job as a leader is actually to make some calls when it's 5149 and not everyone is in agreement. But your job as a leader is to make sure you at least have heard everyone out and genuinely understand the different points of view and challenge your thinking and don't get locked in and dug in early on because I'll tell you sort of a little bit of the dynamic sort of behind the scenes if you were sitting in the executive suite of Deloitte in the early days of the pandemic that really brings this to life. We're so large in terms of the proportion of the broader economy that we serve that you can go back 30 years and you can graph out Deloitte growth with the broader economy and GDP statistics and you'd find a lot of correlation. And so in the second quarter of 2020, in the brunt of the early days of the pandemic, you know, the banks were forecasting GDP drops of 30 to 35% on an annualized basis. You could see the underlying you know, recession was you know, more severe than, than, than any since the, the Great Depression. And if you had just taken the historical correlations in terms of what that would have done to the demand for our services, you would have potentially taken one course of action that would have turned out to be incredibly wrong relative to what actually transpired. What actually transpired is that this set of circumstances led to demand for what we do going way up. Lo and behold, it turned out that you know, models are only as good as the, sort of the relevance of the circumstances reflected in the historical data. And all the historical data wasn't reflective of a, you know, economic contraction induced by a global pandemic. The economy behaved very differently. You might remember in the early days people talking about a K-shaped recovery where certain sectors were shooting up. Everything sort of tech economy centric and in certain sectors, the downward part of the K, those things more sort of in-person oriented, taking a turn down, well, that's what happened. Totally disconnected from the historical correlations. And that's where you know, having a little bit of strategic patience, not rushing to believe you have it all figured out immediately in a set of circumstances that was literally unprecedented, taking the views and the temperature of a lot of different people to ultimately come to a well-informed point of view benefited us tremendously. And then the other dimension of this is you're not going to be a very good leader at all unless you're fueling yourself. And that dimension of the combination of physical health, fitness, mental health, prioritizing well-being, and you're going to come across as disingenuous if you talk about those things to your people, but you're not practicing them for yourself. All of those things come together in helping you remain grounded during what is, you know, inevitably, for everybody's human, a pretty stressful environment. Okay, my last question, which is, obviously, you've been extremely successful with your career, uh, but you have people in the room here who are at the, the front end of their careers. What, what have you learned in terms of your accumulated wisdom and experience that you wish you had known earlier? I'd probably highlight two things. Um, one is that your career 
is a marathon. You are sometimes conditioned to treat it like a sprint and over vector toward the immediate, but recognize that you're going to go through ups and downs. You're going to have things that don't go perfectly, but so long as you treat them in a spirit of continuous learning and growth, they actually are all additive in the context of an overall very long career. The other dynamic that I do think is important to remember, particularly in, in an environment that is being so dominated by advanced technology, is to not forget what differentiation humans have over technology. And, and I'm, I'm sharing this for a reason, because there's, there's, a, there's a real debate out there over whether sort of the right way to succeed in society is to spend 100% of your time becoming deeply expert in one particular thing versus to be sort of more of a generalist in nature. And there, there's a combination that seems to be optimal in this economic environment. Um, you want to be great at something. You want to pick some domain and really develop a professional expertise. Just the rigor and the discipline that comes with achieving excellence in some domain is important. But it's not in and of itself enough, and there's a point of diminishing returns. So if you're dealing with a field where it's subject to a very specific prescriptive set of rules, yes, it's true that further refining your expertise and spending yet more and more time becoming the world's greatest expert in just that one thing, that will maximize value if, if you, know, you want to be the world's greatest chess player. But that's also the domain in which technology is proving to be superior to humans and those things that are subject to prescriptive sets of rules. And so wh where, where is technology not able to compete with humans? In the area of creativity, of relating different domains, of asking the right questions, of taking an insight in this area and realizing its applicability in this area. And so you, you want to combine expertise in whatever your particular domain is that you choose to focus on with a high level of interest and curiosity in a whole bunch of other things taking place in the broader business world and in the world at large. Because ultimately, the ability to appreciate the bigger picture and integrate those different concepts, that's the competitive advantage that you have over technology that I don't see changing even as the AI gets more and more sophisticated decade after decade. And so it's really the intersection of those two things that leads to the highest quality, most effective leaders in a really dynamic economy. OK, excellent advice. So we have microphones back here. If we have people who have questions, can you walk up to the microphone there? Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming out to talk to us. Um, I think one topic that I wanted to hear your thoughts about was, I know that ESG is a big topic for companies as well as for um, like professional support or professional services companies that serve other companies. So wanted to hear kind of what you're seeing out in the market. Like, are your clients trying to grow that faster than, than some of the professional services companies? Or are you guys like staffing up in anticipation of, of a big market there for the next few years? I really appreciate you raising that topic. If, if you were to look at or what's evolved in the conversation in the C-suite over the last six months, the topic that has probably risen in promise, prominence more than any other is ESG and climate in particular. And in part because it's been so visible in people's real lives with the number of, 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 of different sort of weather and climate induced events and the sort of realization around the imperative and in answer to your question we're making massive investments in scaling our ESG practice in response to what is the desire of clients to help them through this and to architect an overarching climate transition strategy and you see companies making big commitments but again just like in the arena of, of DEI Making the commitment is the easy part. Rearchitecting the entirety of your organization to meet that commitment 
is where the challenge comes in and where the collective expertise of a Deloitte in, in being able to tackle the issue through so many different complex dimensions is incredibly valuable. Now, this is an arena, though, where sort of aspiration and reality have to sort of all be assessed in a balanced way. Everyone sort of should align around the need to decarbonize the economy and the imperative around climate and how, how important this is to the future of humanity. Everyone also needs to recognize the sort of massive underlying transformation that needs to take place and the reliance of society today on some of the more traditional sources of energy, whether we like it or not, where you'd literally have society crumble if those things weren't still part of the equation. And our collective job is to help accelerate that path, to help facilitate that responsible transition, much of which is dependent on a continued innovative mindset of architecting the technologies that actually allow us to meet the energy needs of a global population, but in a decarbonized fashion, which is fortunately a topic that the business community is um, increasingly aligning around. And, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing. Thank you. Other questions? Can you go to the microphone? And if anyone else has a question, we probably have time for one more after this. If you want to go to the microphone, there are two of them here. Hi, hi, sir. So uh, I don't have too much business knowledge, but I'm very interested in you. So I'd like to know what's your biggest characteristic that make you so successful? I appreciate the question. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time during this discussion talking about the importance of keeping an open mind and being willing to understand all sides of complex issues. And that's not to say that you don't ultimately need to make some decisions and align with particular points of view, but that type of an inclusive decision-making process is incredibly important. The other dynamic, as I look back on my career and what's tended to differentiate people in terms of you know, their ultimate success within organizations is communication skills. And what, what I've found is that being able to get to the right answer is certainly important. I, I wouldn't discourage it. <laughs> but if you can't bring other people along the journey and explain it in a way that's understandable and earns their buy-in, the fact that you know it's the right answer doesn't ultimately get you much because you need to be able to bring other people along and help them reach that aligned understanding and ultimately go out and execute. And so being able to take complicated topics that sometimes aren't within the expertise of the other people that you're dealing with and convey them in a pragmatic, plain English fashion that is understandable to others becomes increasingly important as you're leading larger and larger cohorts. Okay, we have, we have time for one last question. Hey Joe, thanks for uh, joining us here at Fuqua. Um, I had a question if you could more specifically characterize the demand effects um, due to COVID, specifically two avenues. Um, if that demand effect has been on average in your practice, or has varied across lines of service? And the second is what the underlying drivers are of those demand effects. Um, it is a somewhat extraordinary environment where those demand effects have been pronounced in a positive direction and incredibly consistent across all the parts of our practice, and that is an unusual environment that is fueling massive growth. So why is that? Well, let's, let's talk about what the conversation is in the C-suite right now in terms of big ticket topics. Every organization is investing massively in 
digital transformation. And we're still in the early stages in terms of the full effect of transforming clients' business models by virtue of leveraging the capacity of these incredible innovations. We have capital markets that are booming, where for about a quarter century, there was a precipitous decline in the number of companies in the US that were choosing to access the public markets. And that's actually turned around uh, very dramatically in the past couple of years with many more companies uh, undertaking initial public offerings, going public through SPAC transactions. That's booming. We have uh, an environment in which government is expanding, trying to meet the needs of its citizens. And, and we actually have a very large practice serving the government at both the federal level and the state level. At the same time, as governments are trying to expand the services they provide, they are looking for how to fund all of that through the tax regime. And that is an incredibly challenging area in an economy that's more and more global and more and more grounded in technology, trying to narrow down which jurisdiction has the right to tax what activity. Incredibly complicated. We have a very low cost of capital. Even with the recent slight uptick in interest rates, still pretty low levels and um, a lot of dry powder out there fueling a ton of acquisition activity. The NMA markets have been very strong over the past few years. And then against that backdrop, we have many, many more risks proliferating that clients need to manage against. We talked about ESG, cyber risks, privacy risks a more challenging regulatory environment. Well, these are the topics that are dominating the C-suite conversation, and Deloitte does all of them. And, and not only do we do all of them, but in many cases, these are interconnected. They're not single siloed issues, but clients are looking for an advisor that's able to integrate solutions across all of them. And it's a huge competitive advantage to have the deep expertise in all of those domains and bring it together. So that is what is right now driving the exponential increases in demand pretty consistently across all of what we do. Okay, well thank you so much. So to, uh, to complete the Coach K theme, <laughs> in appreciation for what you've shared with the Fuqua community, I would like to give you this Coach K signed basketball. Thank you for just an incredibly insightful conversation. So when I woke up this morning, I said, today I'm an honorary Blue Devil, and um, this means a lot. This was very special. Phenomenal questions, great engagement. This was a real privilege. Thanks for having me.